All right. Are you ready to rock, Omar? <laughs> Let's rock it. Uh, welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining us. We're here today for Cobblestone Collective's workshop on Minecraft 101 for educators. If you want to follow along with this presentation or just have access to this resource, you'll notice the link is at the bottom of this uh, page, the cc.page slash mc101edu. And please feel free to use that as needed. So today I'll be presenting. My name is Amara Keel. I'm in Mississauga, Ontario. I reside on Treaty 19 land. My pronouns are he, him, and his. I'm a current educator, just freshly back in the classroom when um, all this COVID mess started. Before that, I was with Microsoft's uh, edu Microsoft Education in Canada's team in Canada, obviously. And uh, Minecraft has always been a passion of mine from that role and before that. And I'm just happy to be able to hear to you share it with everyone. With me is Bailey. And Bailey, please introduce yourself. All right, I'm Bailey Omberg. Um, I am an educator out in Alberta, in the east central part of Alberta, um, kind of in the middle of nowhere. Uh, I teach uh, I teach secondary humanities, but I also currently have a role as a literacy support and consultant for my division, which I'm super happy to be doing. I just love it. I also present with Calvison in my spare time, which I also love because it fills my cup so much, connecting with educators all across Canada. I'm super pleased to be with you here in this session. My pronouns are she, her, and hers, and I am uh, currently residing on Treaty 6 territory. Before we get going, I would like to acknowledge that we are all learning from the traditional land of one of many Indigenous groups across Canada. I acknowledge that I'm presenting from the traditional territory of the Mississauga the Credit people, from which I'm able to learn, explore, and share my passion for technology with you. Um, I share this in the spirit of inclusivity, to recognize historical wrongs, and express gratitude to those that came before me. If you want to learn what land you reside on and just kind of see the historical makeup of Canada before the settlers arrived, I encourage you to go to native-land.ca and explore where your land originated. As mentioned earlier, we are presenting on behalf of the Cobblestone Collective. We run all types of workshops. Um, one of the cool workshops I do want to give a shout out to is we do student facing workshops, which are available to all educators across Canada and the world. If you get on board one of those, we can come into your classroom virtually through a meeting, take over for the day, teach your students how to log in, show them how to play. It's a really fun experience. Um, check out the website cobblestonecollective.ca. Learn more about that if you want to continue your Minecraft journey after today. Let's talk about what today's plan is. We're going to keep it really basic, keep it really simple and baseline. We're going to learn about what is Minecraft Education Edition? How can I play Minecraft? Then Talk about building your first build as an educator or as a student. And then we're going to get you ready to use Minecraft in your journey by showing you some resources that are available for Minecraft Education Edition. And we'll see where it goes from there. Let's talk about why we use Minecraft Education Edition in our classrooms. The theory around it is called game-based learning. We learn while we're playing games, we learn while we're having fun, and we can show our learning more naturally and in a more relaxed way um, through a game rather than through formal testing or formal assignments. It kind of just helps students engage faster and show what's in them, um, if it's possible, through that game. And one of the best things about Minecraft is it makes a lot of possibilities for students while they're having fun and enjoying a game. If you don't know what Minecraft is and this is your first exposure to it, think of it as digital Legos. That's what it is at the baseline level, but it's so much more than just a video game. Um, it's a whole media empire at this point. There are books, there's comics, uh, there's YouTube videos of people playing it, YouTube cartoons made around it. Like it's just a lot of different things. I'm not gonna say all your students have played Minecraft, but I guarantee you they've engaged with it in some media form um, in one way or another. Here are some of the benefits of Minecraft in the classroom and why we as educators, in my opinion, should engage with it in our classrooms. It promotes student engagement, student collaboration. It allows students uh, an opportunity to creatively explore lessons, and it offers you as an educator tangible learning outcomes. 
The student engagement piece is one of the greatest benefits of Minecraft. You tell them, hey, we're going to play a video game for this lesson today. You're going to have a pretty high amount of buy-in for a lesson, as opposed to if you tell them we're going to do a traditional reading or a traditional worksheet. Um, you're giving them a video game. They're buying into that lesson at the start of it, no matter what. And if that lesson is shaped in a way that allows them to have fun while showing their learning throughout it, that student engagement is going to maintain and keep on going. Um, they just love playing video games. They love having fun, and it offers them that. It also gives students a chance for collaboration. And I don't mean that in them playing together in the world. They can do that and they're going to collaborate. They're going to get inside the world. You tell them to build something, they'll build it together. But it also allows them to collaborate while they're playing alone. If you're having them play alone in your classroom, you're going to see it get loud really fast. But if you listen to those conversations, it's going to quickly become clear that they're talking about what they're doing. I'm building this to show this. Wow, that's awesome. Why did you build that? This is how I did it. Do you want me to show you? Like you just see them interact and even students that might not traditionally be strong in a traditional type of lessons are going to shine because they'll be really good at Minecraft and they're going to show their peers what to do. It gives them an opportunity to be leaders and kind of the center of attention for a day. Um, I can't speak about the importance of that enough. Creative exploration. Um, Minecraft allows students to show their learning. The best way to use Minecraft is to give them an open ended question. For example, if you're teaching maybe grade three social studies, what was important for the settler villages to have? Go build something that's important in the settler village. Many of your students might come up with the idea of the church being central to settler society. They might build that church. They might think about fur trade. They might build you a fur trading outpost. It gives them a chance to kind of show their learning. You give them an open-ended question, tell them to build something important for a lesson. They'll bring in their knowledge and show you, okay, this is what I think is important. This is what I built. And let's go on to tangible learning outcomes because that'll show you how they can show you their learning. What I'm gonna model for you today as I'm playing Minecraft is the different ways you as a teacher can have them explain their thinking. They can write a ton of text in the game, and I'll show that in some pictures in a second as well. Whatever they build, they can take pictures of as well. Once they take pictures of it, they can write text walls next to it. And the next thing you know, they export it as a PDF. Now you have this whole assignment in PDF form. It can be uploaded onto whatever uh, platform you're using, whether that's Microsoft Teams, Google Classroom, D2L. You've collected it there. Um, there's other ways to collect their work as well, but the important piece for you to understand is everything they do in the game has a variety of ways for them to take screenshots, collect what they built, present on your screen. This is what I did. Come into my world, I'll give you a tour, and you can see all their learning outcomes through that. It's built for learning, and um, hopefully, if nothing else, that's going to be clear by the end of today's session. Let's talk about some of my experiences over the year. When I first started playing with Minecraft Education Edition in the classroom, I was really, um, I'm gonna say I was really obsessed with the idea of uh, eco schools. One of my colleagues, Dan Noble and me came up with this concept together and we had a really rocking time doing this. What we essentially envisioned was, hey, we're gonna go around and talk to students about what is an eco-friendly building, what are eco-friendly building features. Once we've explained that to them, what we're going to do next is have them go and build us an eco-friendly room. And that's what you're seeing in this picture over here. That's an eco-friendly room right there. Now, take a look at what they built. They At the, the roof of the building, they built with glasses to allow lots of sunlight to come in. We don't have to use light during the daytime. That's great. Um, there's a compost bin somewhere in that building. And that's why there's a garden out here in that corner. That compost can be taken there, help fresh vegetables um gardens all that stuff fantastic what we didn't even talk about in those lessons is this electric school uh school bus those are solar panels on the roof that the student just thought about and the student attached to it um, which was brilliant so now not only are we building eco-friendly schools we're taking that eco-friendly technology and applying it to cars um just allow the student to show all their ideas same project different product. You can see this is a different eco-friendly school. I like that they use that little blue glass because it allows that sunlight heat to kind of uh, get tempered instead of coming in bright hot through that clear glass. Um, 
just a good connection there. Third project, different product. They put a rooftop garden up there to help uh, absorb some of that sunlight, keep things cool inside the building. Uh, they even started creating a healthy school rather than just creating a classroom like the previous ones did. Notice that they put a basketball court. So it's not only important to have a nice building that's eco-friendly, we need to watch out for ourselves as well. We need to take care of ourselves. Let's have a basketball court out there so we can get some exercise. Now this project's gonna take a different turn. This was a religious studies course for high school students. They learned about, um, for this project, they learned about Islam, Judaism, and Christianity. And then they built the temples, synagogues, and churches that are important to these religions. You'll see in these pictures, I have a nice cathedral church right over here. Look at the central and prominent location of the cross. We have a priest standing there. I don't know if you can see that, but that is a priest character in the game. Stained glass windows. Um, everything's fantastic. And what you can't really see clearly are those four boards here. One, two, three, four. Those boards each contain about two to three paragraphs worth of writing each. So one board is two to three paragraphs worth of writing. That's explaining the prominence of those features in the church, why they're important, why they're central to the religion, importance of the religion or central to the importance of the building. Um, all of that's explained in Minecraft. Not only have we built this beautiful building, we've explained why we built it and what features are important for it to have. The chandelier, great. Um, but yeah. That's uh, that's essentially the products projects I worked on. But let's continue going forward because now we're going to start building a project together. If you're watching this recording after the session, I encourage you to pause and try things for yourself. What I don't encourage you to do is to keep the video playing and try to follow along. If you don't play video games normally, it's going to get messy and frustrating really, really fast. So take your time, pause it, do what I do, and then feel free to unpause it and just continue on to the next step. I'll try to break it down and keep it simple like that. And again, if you normally don't play video games and it's your first time playing Minecraft, don't get intimidated. You might get lost. You might get confused. The controls might be frustrating. The one thing I'll say is it's very important to know the controls so you can help your students in a mess. But after today, if you never want to play Minecraft again, you don't have to. It's only important to know the controls so you can explain it to someone if they need it. But for the most part, you just need to understand what's in the game and how we can use it in your classroom. And the last thing I'm going to say is Minecraft is Minecraft. It's a game. Just relax. Have fun. Don't get frustrated. Like, just laugh this over. Pretty soon you'll be talking to uh, kids, nephews, cousins, people you're close with. And if nothing else, maybe playing Minecraft is going to become a fun story for that. So enjoy it. Uh, before we get to our mission today, why don't I go just switch over to Minecraft? I've logged in. Now, when you do open Minecraft Education Edition for the first time, be mindful it'll work on a variety of devices. You could be on an iPad, you could be on a Chromebook, you could be on a Windows 10 or 11 device. It'll work on all of those. When you open it for the first time, it's just going to ask you to log in. Use your school board credentials. A lot of your students are going to come rushing at you and be like, hey, I have a Minecraft login. Great, do not use your Minecraft login because Minecraft Education Edition has only school path, like only school accounts are allowed to use this. A regular account won't work. So use your school email for yourself and your students. Great spot to get paused. Log in if you need it. Once you are logged in, you're going to be on this main menu. And let's talk about what we're going to do. And I'm going to just put up my mission for one second. I'm going to keep it super simple and we're going to build a house for each of the three little pigs. That's my mission for today. Now, we're going to use a little bit of math on top of those language skills because we've read that story clearly before we're building this. We have that background knowledge noted, loaded. And what we should also have loaded into our knowledge right now is the ability to measure things. Because I want you to make sure when you build this house, the length and the width of any side of the house is not longer than 15 meters. I knew there was one mistake I didn't catch, Bailey. It doesn't say meters. 
15 meters. Okay, so we're going to build that house with those uh, dimensions. I'm going to switch back over to Minecraft. And before we get started, obviously, we have to load a world. So what we're going to do first is go over to play. Then at the bottom left is this blue plus button, which is create new. Let's go ahead and select create new. And then I am going to go over to templates. We're going to create a blocks of grass world and a blocks of grass world is really good for when you're first starting Minecraft because it keeps simple. It creates this flat world, which is a blank canvas. And on that blank canvas, you can draw, create and do whatever you want. You don't have to worry about ecosystems such as rivers, oceans, lakes. Everything is gone except for this flat patch of land on which we can build. So I'm going to select blocks of grass. And then I'm going to go ahead and select create new. And I'm going to start thinking. Oh, once we select that, what I recommend you do is you do rename it to something. So I'm going to call this the three little pigs world. Go ahead with that world name. World names are going to help you remember what you built and um, get back to it in a future date. And I'm going to hit play. And now that world is going to load up. Sorry, that was a good time for a coffee break. And voila, I am in this world. And just like I promised you, it's this flat world, goes on forever, but it's flat. And the cool thing about this is I can just build whatever I need to on it. And it's there for me. So before we start building anything, what I encourage you to do is move around. You'll notice all my controls are on the left hand side of the screen and you'll notice I'm using a keyboard. So it says W is forward, S is back, A is to straight left, D is to straight right. If you're on the iPad, those controls should be um, explained to you how to play the game in on an iPad. But on the keyboard device, they'll display like that. What I encourage you to do is just run around in a circle. That's the first thing you should do if you're playing this. Great spot to pause it and just experience movement. And you might not be pausing this either. You might just want to watch me play, and that's totally cool too. One of the reasons why um, I really recommend that you pause it is because one hour isn't a lot of time to play Minecraft, and I'm trying to get through a lot of content. And if all you want to do is kind of watch me play and learn how to play Minecraft, like how we use it with our students, that's one way to use this workshop. You don't have to pause it and just experience it. You can just watch me play. That's totally cool. All right, great. We ran around in the circle. If you really want to have fun, start flying, press spacebar two times, hold it. This is going to be important for building taller buildings. Flying is a super important skill. And even if you never use it again, it's just important to show our students how to use it. And I did that by pressing spacebar two times and holding it. And if I want to come down super fast, I press spacebar two times and boom, I'm back. You'll notice I'm not getting hurt because we're playing on blocks of grass, which is a creative world. Nothing can hurt me here and there's nothing even offensive around. Like there's nothing here that can even attack me like a zombie. That's completely removed from the game in this world. What I'm going to do right now is think about what do I need to build a house for the three little pigs now? I remember there being a house made out of sticks. There was a house made out of straw. There was a house made out of bricks. Let's get those materials. I'm going to press E for inventory, or I like to say E for everything, to be honest, but sure, E for inventory. Great. That's opened up my inventory. You'll notice this is a huge pool of materials I can use of all colors, shapes, and sizes, some vegetables, some eggs to create uh, animals if I need it. This is overwhelming. I am I am completely overwhelmed at this point myself. One cool thing is at the top of this inventory is this little magnifying glass automatically. That's where you should be. If you started the blocks of grass world, you can click over here. And what I'm going to do right now is search for hay because I can build a straw house using these hay bales. Love it. If you're following along, what you want to do is after searching for whatever material you want to build your house out of, 
left click on it one time and then put it here at the bottom. This is called, called our hotkey bar. Whatever we put there can be used fast to build what we need really, really fast instead of going in our inventory all the time. Um, I put that hay bale there. I'm also going to search for bricks. Notice there are a lot of bricks. What I really recommend you do, no matter what brick you choose for yourself, is make sure it's a nice cube shaped one, not a flat square, not a stairway, not a fence. Those are all important skills to learn at a later point, but if this is your first time playing Minecraft, the easiest thing to build with is a full, uh, fully cubed item. I'm gonna grab that brick block, and again, just left click it. If you're on an iPad, just tap that brick, and then tap down there on that second hotkey bar. Left click there if you're using a mouse. So we got our hay bale, we got our brick, and maybe I am also going to get some wood now because there's no way to build this out of sticks, but I can build it out of wood, and that's good enough. And why don't we use some spruce wood planks? And you'll notice there's a ton of materials there. That's Choose whatever you want to build with. Just make sure it's a nice cube shape because that's the easiest to build with. And once you've gotten three of those items there, let's talk about how we build. I'm going to close my inventory by selecting that little tiny X there. And now notice I'm holding that Bay of Hail in my right hand on my screen. That's because right now I'm inside my hotkey bar number one, right at the front there. You'll notice next to my hotkey bar at the bottom of my screen, and the number two slot is the brick. So when I press two on my keyboard, I'm holding a brick. And if I press three on my keyboard, I'm holding the wood planks. If I press four, I'm holding nothing. That's just my bare empty hand, five, six, seven, eight. That's because I haven't put anything on those key bars there. But when I press one again, it switches me back to a hay bale. If you're using a mouse, use the mouse wheel. That'll move you through all your items as well. And again, if you normally don't play Minecraft, or even if you do play Minecraft, a mouse is very helpful. Strong recommendation you use a mouse. If you're brave like me and you don't mind, you might just be using a touchpad, and that's totally fine too. But if you do find it frustrating on the touchpad of your device, grab a mouse, it'll make your life easier. Okay. Now we've already figured out, hey, we are building a house that has no side longer than 15 meters wide. Now you'll notice as I'm aiming at the floor, it gives me a little outline of a black cube shape. And if I right click on my device, you'll notice it places down my Bay of Hell because that's what I'm holding on my hand. That's one meter cubed. So I know that one square or one cubed item is about one meter long. This wall is now two meters long. I'm just going to lay down some plot. And if you want to build, it's as easy as right clicking on your device. Right click, right click, right click, right click. And if you make a mistake, hey, I want to destroy something. That's left click, left click, left click. On an iPad, tap the screen to build or hold the item to destroy. Practice that if you want. Pause it, place some items down. Great. Now we've created this wall one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten meters long. That is awesome. I'm happy with that. I'm going to just build another side to this wall here and just move there. Great. And just keep building. One thing I want to show you that you might struggle with and some of your students might struggle with. Notice what I'm trying to build in the sky, I can't. I'm right clicking for the life of me right now and nothing is going up in the sky. That's because Minecraft has an internal logic. You can only build from the ground up. So I can always place more blocks vertically and that's why it's important to fly. Notice I can't build up high there because I can't reach there. I have a limited amount of reach. That's why I'm gonna just fly up I can build this taller if I wanted to. So it's important to actually learn how to move because that helps you kind of position yourself. And if you did want to build something in the sky, just tear it down. You just got to build a pillar up there, start the foundation, and then you could even be building a house in the sky. Well, let's leave that for next time. 
I encourage you to continue building your house. I'm just going to finish my foundation if you bear with me. Notice I'm flying at this point because, like I said, it is super important to learn to fly. The more vertical your build is, the more higher you need to go. Now, the other thing that some people struggle with when they first start playing this game is how do I build a roof? Well, number one, you fly. Then just place a block there, build it across. Pretty simple. And I'm just going to break that. I'm almost done with my first house, as you can see. Great. The last thing I'm going to do is break a hole in there, search for a door, and let's just place that there. You'll notice inside it's super dark. Um, if you're working on any science lessons on lighting, that works in Minecraft. I'm just going to poke some holes in there to allow some light to come in. Great. Oh, I want to make it symmetrical. Sorry, and perfect. And perfect. Okay, my straw house is done. I'm just going to quickly just do the same thing by laying a foundation for my brick house, and then we'll talk about how we're going to measure this out. Because this is what a lot of your students are going to do. They're not going to do it like I did the first time. I was counting how many bricks I was laying down, and I knew exactly that one of my sides was 10 meters long. But hey, maybe I just laid it down like this. I didn't even count how much I built. Lessons done. Houses are finished. How am I going to measure this? One thing that really helps me measure in Minecraft is when I play, press E for everything, I like to get a glass block. Because if you remember our mission, which I'll put up again, is not only are we building it, making sure no size is longer than 15. Something else I'm going to ask my students is, let's calculate the perimeter of this build, OK? Let's calculate the perimeter of what we built. The first thing I'm going to do is figure out how much I built. I pressed E for everything. I got a glass block. I like the clear one. Use whatever one you want. Notice this makes it much easier for me to understand the measurement of that brick. Because if I look at this wall of bricks, I got to kind of go over it slowly to figure out how many there are. If I place the glass in front of it, this is easy for me to see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven meters right there. I'm going to press E for everything. I'm going to grab a sign. And let's put that down here, seven meters. And I'm going to do the same thing. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine meters over there. And I'm just going to place that, nine meters. And using my logic, I understand that this backside is seven meters long. And I understand this one is nine meters long. Great. Now I've done that. Now, if you were calculating surface area, again, you can use these glass blocks on the roof to help you even measure the roof. I know the surface area of this little roof patch over here is going to be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Sorry, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And I'm just going to put eight meters here so I understand. Eight meters. One, two, three, four, five. Five meters. And now I can even multiply eight by five, and that gets me 40. And I understand the surface area of my roof patch over here is... um. 40 meters cubed. But 
I only want to focus on area and perimeter. So let's go back to my brick house because I have it completely mapped out at the base level. Nine meters by seven meters. What I'm going to do to show my math work is I'm going to press E for everything one more time. I'm going to get out a board. Now the board is great because as I mentioned earlier, it lets me write a whole lot more. So what I'm going to do is stick it right here in front of my brick house. And I'm going to write seven meter plus seven meter plus nine meter plus nine meters equals. I'm going to use my fingers to count right now, 14 and then 18. Gets me 32 meters squared. And the perimeter of my brick house is 32 meters squared. I can't make that keyboard squared symbol, so I'm just writing squared down. Uh, bear with me on that. Notice I could have wrote quite a bit more on this board, but that's enough for now. Cool. So take a look at what we've done so far. We read a story. We built a house based around that. Then we measured our house. Think about how this lesson could be adapted for almost any subject, right? From social studies, history, um, language arts, and then go cross curricular with it as well. We've gathered all this information. We built it. And the other thing we really didn't do was build our insides. I now built a nice exterior on this house. But maybe one thing I want to do was go inside the house. Grab a nice little bed for where that uh, pig, one of the three little pigs would have slept. Um, place that in there. I could have gotten a lot more furniture. We have a lot of options to decorate that house, paintings. So if you were working with uh, on a literary literature unit, you could have actually had them design a room, a complete interior for a character. Design a bedroom for Hamlet. What would be important to show Hamlet's emotions? I would kind of think that the students are going to use an emo motif for Hamlet's bedroom, right? Use darker colors. Um, if you take a look at the furniture, they have some skull items available. You can make it into a pretty dark room to kind of reflect Hamlet's psyche, if that's the route you want it to go down. You don't have to make this a three little pig lesson. This could work with almost any grade. You've built that interior. What you might want to do now is label that interior as well. Using that sign, I don't have to just use it to do math. I can just add this building. Uh, sorry, this label on the inside. This is the bed for the first pig to sleep on. The other thing I might want to label inside this house, I'm going to just put that on the interior as well. This house is made of straw. And then I'm going to put another one. The straw was weak and was blown down by the wolf. So I've added more narration to explain what I built so that you as a teacher can actually see your students thinking. They don't just have to build something and you guess what they built. Um, they can explain all their logic, all of that stuff's there. So we did our math work. We explained our math uh, calculations there. We've shown all our math work using those glass cubes as well. We went inside, we added some details, and I kind of uh, put signs up, posted those details. You know what, it's really dark in there. I know you're having some trouble, so let me grab a torch. And I'm just gonna do some really quick lighting. And hopefully that makes it a little bit clearer for you to see. Okay. Great, let's call it a day. Let's go home. Not yet, because we've created all this great stuff, but the teacher hasn't received it yet. So let's talk about different ways for you as a teacher to collect this. Just like before, I'm going to press E for everything. And once I do, I'm going to search for two items. Number one is a camera. Number two is a portfolio. Now I'm going to use that camera to take a picture of a couple of different things. Maybe I want to take a picture of what I built. 
And all I did that is I put the camera inside my hand on my hotbar. Then I just hold the right click button. You'll notice the frames come down and then I just frame my shot. And when I let go. Oh, nice rear shot of that cow there. OK, um, moving on. Let's get a picture of this sign. Seven meters. The boards are a little tricky to get a picture of. If you try to right click with your camera on the board, it makes you start typing, as you can see. What you want to do is look right above it into the sky. Hold down right click so the camera frame comes down. Move your head down. Let go. Nice shot of that board. All that's there. And maybe the last thing I'll do is uh, get a nice shot of some of my writing here. OK, we've grabbed those pictures. What's next? I'm going to go switch over to my portfolio, put that in my hand. Oh, wait, I'm going to go back to my camera because you got to take time to always take a selfie. I'm going to stand where I want with what I want behind me. I right click on the floor to place my camera. Right click again and notice the camera starts following me around and smoking. That's cool because it's going to grab a selfie with me. Great. Now I got everything I want, all my work, and a selfie. Pro tip, don't ever let your students do this like I did. You'll notice I'm taking all the pictures I want. I'm not really thinking about it. Um, if you let your students take all the pictures they want, you're easily going to get like 30 or 40 plus pictures from one student. And if you get that many pictures from each of your students, that's going to be a lot of work. I like to always limit the pictures I'm going to look at. Tell my students straight up, I'm only going to look at five pictures. You give me any more. I'm only looking at the first five. That helps limit the amount of work you have to do if you're collecting pictures, because we'll talk about other ways to collect this. I'm going to go over to my portfolio, right click with it. Notice I got my pictures here. One, two, and if I press that arrow, three, four, five, six. That's all I took, so that's great. If I only wanted five pictures, now what my student has to do is think really hard. Which picture am I going to get rid of? And if they don't get rid of those pictures, I as the teacher am not looking past page five. So I would automatically not mark page six and onwards. That's up to you. Uh, I think the selfies are very useful. So I'm going to go underneath it. I'm going to press that trash can and voila, the picture is deleted. You'll notice underneath every picture is a caption. I can add an additional sentence or two under my and you'll notice it's locked there. So you can roughly fit a sentence underneath each picture if you really wanted to. The next thing you could do from there is select export portfolio. And the next thing you know, it's going to save it as a PDF. And you press that button, it'll ask you where do you want to save this? It'll export all those pictures as a PDF. But with older students, maybe you want them to write more. So you have one other option. First, no matter what you get the camera, you take those pictures. The other thing you could have done is grabbed a uh, book and quill. I'm just going to search for a quill. Notice that gets me that book and quill. I'm going to grab that, toss that here. Right click and voila. I can write out a whole paragraph or two on this side of the page explaining what is the significance of my picture? What picture, you ask? On the second page, I can go over there to that pencil right underneath it. Select that picture plus sign right there. And I'll notice all those pictures that are in my portfolio I can import. And I can import them at my in my own order. I don't have to import them the way they were taken, like it does in the portfolio. So let's go ahead and select that picture. So I'm spending a whole page explaining the importance of uh, what I wrote there about the straw being weak and how the wolf was able to blow it down. And remember, it doesn't have to be about this. This could have been an open ended project. You give students an open ended goal, let them figure out what is significant about what you're looking for and then build that out in Minecraft because they can. We're just scratching the surface in this uh, session. You can go really, really crazy. There's whole electric circuitry in Minecraft. It's called Redstone. There's a full chemistry update. You can do chemistry experiments in this virtual world. There's a ton of stuff you can do, OK? It doesn't just have to be building. And everything they do can be documented and uh, 
taking pictures of like this. Now with our book, we got to take an extra step before we can export it as a port uh, as a PDF. You'll notice right now I'm in the rough draft of the book. I can go back into it. I can edit it. I can move my cursor, erase things if I want. Go to additional pages, add more content, add more pictures. When you're done, you better make sure you're done because when you create this in when you publish this book, essentially get the final draft ready. You can't edit it anymore. So when the student is done with the project, they're happy with all this. What they're going to do is sign it. And when they sign it, the book is published and can no longer be edited. So be mindful of that. Make sure students understand that. I'm going to go ahead and sign it right now. What's the title of my book? Uh, three little pigs. Yep. Let's change that to three little pigs because that fits. And then sign and close. Notice my book changed to this purple glowy icon. Phenomenal. I can right click and open that book. Notice I can read it. And now instead of sign it, you'll notice there's an export there. And if you click that export button, you can save it as a PDF again anywhere on your computer. And once you save it as a PDF, it's up to you as a teacher to designate where those students send it. Do you want it emailed to you? Do you want it uploaded onto your class uh, classroom tools such as Microsoft Teams, Google Classroom, D2L? Whatever you're using, it can be sent where it needs to go. And once it's there, voila, we've documented all this work. Now, the other thing you could have done is you could have plugged the student's device onto a projector, have them give you a virtual tour of their world in front of their classroom. And please, even if you're not going to do that for every student, at the end of a lesson, build out some time for a few students that are really excited to show what they built in Minecraft. It's going to be very good, a good experience for them, good presentation practice for everyone. And if you want, go ahead and mark that as a presentation, and you don't need to collect those pictures then. They've given you a tour of that world. Make sure it's timed. Show me what's important in that time. Great. We're done with it. Now, the other thing you can do is I'm going to press escape on my keyboard on the iPad. You can pause it. And you'll notice there's this icon right next to this world icon. There's these four faces. I can start hosting. And that means I create a multiplayer world. I can invite people to connect to me. I'm going to just select start hosting so you see it. You get this code, carrot, potion, fish, Steve. That code is to join my world. And if you're trying to join the world right now, you're not allowed to, to be honest. It only allows you to connect to people in your school board with your school board email. You can't connect to anyone outside your school board. That's a safety feature to keep everything safe and fun in Minecraft and to make sure it's being used appropriately in school and not for anything else. So if you were in my school board and you entered that code, you could actually come into this world. You could tour what I built take notes. You could have marked them that way if you wanted. Students can also download their world from their main menu and send it to you that way. You have all those options. Um, we are getting really tight on time, so I'm going to move forward from here. But that's just a couple different ways we did this. Right now, I'm actually going to just go back to this world icon and select save and exit. Let's close this and let's talk about some next steps because you might have done your first project with Minecraft like I did. And maybe you're thinking, hey, there's got to be other ways to use Minecraft. Well, the good news is there are a ton of different ways to use Minecraft. I'm going to go back to the main menu by selecting that back arrow. Let's go through step by step what resources you have. The newest and latest lessons and worlds are always on the main menu under new and featured. You'll notice we have lessons on building your emotions. So social emotional learning is a super core part of Minecraft. Helping students connect and collaborate is one of the main goals of using this in your classroom. Learn about how to be an active citizen. Buildability, that's all about accessibility and how we can build buildings that are accessible for everyone, whether that's in our community, in our school space, in our personal space, that's a really solid lesson. Climate futures, transportation, cyber safety, lessons in good trouble, which is all about civil rights. All those lessons are there. And let's say I want to do lessons in good trouble. I can select that. If I click create world, I am actually going to enter that lessons in good trouble world. You can see it's a whole urban world, lots of characters in it. I'm not in a flat world by myself. That's a whole experience you're going to go through. And I encourage you to select one of these lessons and experience it for yourself. If you've been following it along, great spot deposit. Just create a world and look around in it. But before you do look around, 
Why am I looking around? Notice that there's a link to a lesson plan. There's a whole description of the lesson, the learning objectives, essential questions, prep notes, student activities, assessment. We'll go through all that point by point in a minute. But notice I can do all of that there. And if I want to assign this or share this with my class, hey, I can even send it straight to my Google Classroom right now. And there's a way to send it to Teams, but we'll talk more about that from the website. Um, I'm going to go back. I'm going to go back one more time. That's not a lot of lessons. It's only like um, eight. Guess what? There's even more. Select play. Select view library. Now the cool thing to do is maybe you're doing a lesson which necessitates some type of ecosystem. Maybe you want to go to a swamp. Maybe you want to go to some badlands. Maybe you want to go to a forest. If you select these starter worlds and select biomes, notice you can build something in ancient Egypt by selecting the desert biome for a project based on that. If you're studying about South uh, America or parts of Asia, we have a jungle biome for you. If you want to go to Antarctica or the North Pole, great. We got the ice ice plains up there. We have an ocean. The ocean has a fully functioning coral reef, warm ocean biome. Um, we've just scratched the surface. There's a lot. And you, you'll notice there are some uh, fantasy based biomes such as a warped forest, soul sand valley, the nether biome. The nether biome is a great place if you're studying Egypt to create an underworld down there. That's actually a pretty fun idea. Or the nether wastes is again another place to just illustrate the afterlife if you wanted. I'm going to go back. The other thing that's super easy if you're just starting Minecraft, something I recommend you do is the monthly build challenges. These lessons are very similar to what I did. They're very open ended. This is what I want you to do. Now go ahead and do it. You choose how you want to do it. For example, we give you this book cover template. Now design a book cover for me that'll fit on that. Now what's important in the book cover, that's all stuff that needs to be front loaded and then the student can go ahead and get it done. All those lesson plans are available if you select that. We'll go there in a second. Build a Mars rover for science. All these ideas are there and you'll notice there are a ton. I can't go through them one by one. Uh, pixel portraits, that's a fun one. Physics coaster, sculpture gardens, solar model. Um, maybe you're looking for something a little bit meatier. Subject kits. Broken down by subjects. Maybe we want to do history and culture. Do you want to go see what the Chinese Tang Dynasty capital looked like? You can go there. Do you want to take a tour of the city of Florence? You can. Explore ancient Egypt. Why not? There's, uh, excuse me, um, special shout out to Manito Abe Aki. If you don't have time to do any of these worlds, please go over there. That was built in Canada. It's talking about the importance of indigenous culture. Um, those that came before the settlers, connect to that one 100%. Um, I'll give you a chance to do that. And maybe we can do that together right now because if I want to select this lesson, notice when I click lesson plan, it's just going to open up a new window. It didn't take me directly to that lesson, but we'll get there. Um, it actually took me to the main education hub. This is where you'll go if you will go to education.minecraft.net. I think they're updating this. That's probably why the link is broken, but I'll show you how to get to that lesson plan in one second. Once you do get to education.minecraft.net, just scroll down a little. You'll notice it just explains what's the importance of Minecraft, how it's been used in the classroom. I would say don't do any of that stuff. Just go to the top. Go over to how it works, or sorry, teach with Minecraft. One thing that I would recommend you do before you also look at lesson plans is if you're super inspired right now and you want to continue with your Minecraft journey, go to Get Trained. Get Trained is going to take you on like an eight hour course of learning how to play, how to apply it in your classroom, apply and enrich. It'll go step by step, teach you everything we've done in this session so far and how to go beyond that. It uses Microsoft Learn, so if you select Start Courses for that, you'll log in on the site by selecting Sign In. It'll track your progress. You'll even get a certificate if you want to put that in your portfolio. Um, take a chance to explore Microsoft Learn. It doesn't just have to be about Minecraft. If you want to explore OneNote uh, Immersive Reader, which is built into Minecraft and I didn't even have time to show you, it's all there. But I'm going to come back to education.minecraft.net. I'm going to go back to Teach with Minecraft, and you'll notice other than getting trained and using Microsoft Learn to train myself, I can even go to explore lessons. 
Oh, sorry, I keep looking at the watch because I know we're really tight on time. I just want to be mindful of that. In these lessons, again, it's broken down through science. I'm going to go back to history and culture. If I wanted to, I could even just type in Manito Abe Aki. I must have misspelled it. Apologies. Let's just leave it Manito. Perfect. And you'll notice it popped up there. I can open up that lesson. Now from this lesson, let's check out what the guiding ideas are. This was built in Canada. This one line aligns perfectly with the Canadian curriculum. Um, some of the lesson plans, if you go through it, they are Common Core uh, American curriculum, but they are adding uh, Canadian curriculum guides. It's being updated all the time. Notice I can download that world if I needed to learn a video lesson plan guide watch the video, see what the lesson looks like. You don't have to play it even. Um, all those resources are there. And from there, if I wanted to, if I go all the way to the top, I can even share and assign this world now by selecting that link. And now I could have selected Microsoft Teams if I wanted. Google Classroom, if you're on D2L, copy that link, um, just paste it there, that's up to you. Like I've only shown you this one uh, link. Notice I can get the educator and student guides. That would include any worksheets if it's a part of this lesson. It would be included on that side panel right there. So if you're looking through these lessons, it's not just all about Minecraft. They do have other resources that you can use for offline lessons before you even connect. Um, I really encourage you to look through those lessons. We have done so much in one hour. Kudos to you if you actually paused it and played it. Kudos to you if you stuck around and just kind of watched me play it, because hopefully, if nothing else, you have a basic understanding of what Minecraft looks like in our classrooms, what we can expect from it, and what some simple goals are to kind of get you and the students exploring how to use it inside an education setting. I modeled kind of how to do mathematics, how we can do our measurement, and then how we go cross-curricular. Not only do we build something, we can build something of significance and use text to explain what the significance is, and then we collect it using our camera, our portfolio, inviting people into our world, projecting it, because guess what? If you can plug in your device to your projector, you can stream it for other people to see, and they can use it as a presentation skill. If you're using Flipgrid, it integrates with Minecraft. You could have been using Flipgrid. Um, and hopefully, if nothing else, it's clear how this kind of all plugs in. It's not just a video game. It's a video game that helps students learn and have fun and just rock it all together with great um, synchronization. Thank you so much for your time. Keep that resource handy and uh, keep in mind upcoming workshops on Minecraft. If you want to continue this learning journey, we have Minecraft training courses that dive into more depth. We have student facing workshops that kind of model how to teach in your classroom so you can see us do it. And then if you're feeling confident, you keep on carrying that torch from there. Thank you so much for your time.